I and speaking of having way too much material to cover in uh, not enough time, uh, let's see. Sat, there is a lot to Sat, and actually, the, we could spend like literally, I think, the rest of the semester just looking at Sat and all the various applications and uh, uh, you know things I can build on top of Sat, things that I can port Sat to, the, the uses of Sat, writing Sat, solvers, etc. And I think it actually be might be a pretty interesting uh, semester. So we, uh, we, I sort of introduced this problem uh, the last lecture. Uh, I mean, the, the basic idea with SAT is that uh, uh, you get a Boolean expression, which and uh, doesn't even have to be complicated, it turns out. Uh, it's, you've just got a bunch of Boolean variables. They can only be true or false. They're anded and ORed. And uh, you just find the, uh, find the inputs that make the expression come out to true, which is trivial for simple expressions, right? If I've got like A and B and C, they all got to be true. If I get A or B or C, any one of them being true is fine. Uh, uh, so it, it, essentially, this is uh, this is this what it, a superficially simple sounding problem, uh, and, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, I claim this is an NP type problem. What makes it NP? Yeah. So if if somebody gives you the certificate that proves that it's true, uh, in this case, the certificate is the list of variables. And the, and the values. So A has to be true, B has to be false. Then in polynomial time, you can go through and see if the expression actually comes out to be true. So for example, and uh, I have been chasing these little over bars around my slides. Actually, many of my slides had the over bars. They just were white on a white background. So that's why they were invisible. Actually, anytime anyone changes the font or Google decides to relay out the fonts, then that, uh, that actually all my little over bars go skittering off into the darkness. So here, we, we only have four Boolean variables, one, two, three, and four. So by inspection, can you figure out what, uh, how to make this one true? Okay, so if, if I make one true and I make two true, then that gets through these outer clauses. So, so essentially, like, every one of these clauses, so, so the, the notation seems different in different places, but x1 false, so x1 bar means x1 has to be false for this clause to be true. P plus means or, and then, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're sort of, it's, it's like multiplication. So essentially, every one of these clauses has to be true in the end. So we can, we can make, so x1 true and x2 true sounds, sounds reasonable, but uh, then I guess we have to make x4 false yes. to make this one true. And then if we make x3 true, okay, so, so this is maybe not, uh, uh, it's not so yeah. So, so that, uh, and I, I forget what values we had there, but basically uh, x1, x2, x3 were all true, and x4 had to be false. Uh, you, you, but you, you can see, for example, where if it, so a slight modification of this could actually get to the point where it's actually a little bit tricky. So for example, I have to choose, like, do I want to use x1 true to make this one true, or to make x1 false to make this one true, because I have no other way to make this one true, because like x4 had to be false to make this one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and a particular surprising part about this is you can have an arbitrarily complex decision that you have to make with all of these trade-offs, and you can encode it all as one giant SAT instance. Uh, so essentially, the, 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 there's an easy algorithm for this, which is you just try all the, you just write out the truth table. So that uh, if, I, if, if you write out the truth table, essentially, you know, uh, Boolean variables, if I have n of them, then I have two to the n entries in my truth table, and then I just uh, pick a row where basically everything is true. That You notice that this expression actually is true a lot, right? There's several different uh, ways to make this one true, whereas if you, you know, just uh, changed around a little bit, you can end up having literally zero of them be true. And in particular, it's actually, it's normally easy by inspection to find one if there's a lot of trues. Uh, or if it's the, you get lucky and uh, it's the first one you look at where they're all true or they're all false or something. But uh, in, in general, we actually, so surprising fact, there is no better known worst case algorithm than writing out the truth table, which takes exponential time, right? Despite the fact that if you could find, you know, the one uh, 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 listing that makes things uh, to work out, then you could solve it in polynomial time, which is kind of surprising. 
Uh, so, uh, see, th this is equivalent to a bunch of stuff. So, so th th there's a bunch of easy uh, t uh, equivalencies for sat, right? And, and uh, sat is sort of designed after, so, you know, the something from uh, uh, the EE e department, right? That, uh, it, and essentially, uh, right, so if, if, so the over bars, I'm actually making inverters here. And it, essentially, like a three input AND gate is essentially what this is. So it's pulling the uninverted copy of X1, the inverted copy of X3, if I wired this up correctly, and the uh, the uninverted copy of X4, and uh, and it, it, etc. So, so the, the surprising fact here is that uh, you can actually simply you can uh, if you got exponential work to do, you can actually do it relatively efficiently in hardware by just uh, so, so I could have a programmable set of uh, uh, I guess you'd need a big crossbar array in here. Uh, t to do this, but essentially I could have a I could have a counter that's counting at gigahertz, and I could be checking, you know, uh, 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 I think arbitrarily big, probably Ripple would get to you at some point. But you you could be, you could in particular like build an ASIC that just does this, right? So so one one fix might be to just implement this thing as a circuit, and then and then you know burn burn your way through these. Th there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, logical transformations you can do that are actually equivalent to doing transformations on logic gates, right? And uh, I guess we, you know De Morgan's laws apply to logic gates just as well as they do to Boolean expressions. So this is certainly something that you know you you, you can do. Uh, in software, a question. How large do these get before they're interesting? Uh, and they actually have some relation to another problem. Well, so, so the surprising thing is you can actually encode, like a couple hundred can encode something pretty interesting. And then a, a couple hundred means uh, two to the one hundredth is like too big to sort of just brute force your way through. Right? Uh, surprising fact is that the modern solvers can actually handle million uh, entry sets, which, which they're definitely not using brute force anymore. <laughs> So, uh, in particular, so, so, so you, you ask the question like, how how can you how can you uh, make an asymptotically faster algorithm? It's it's not guaranteed to always work, but uh, the, you know, for some sub cases, it, it can work. So, in, in the nineteen sixties, they they came up with this. Uh, so, it's often called Davis Putnam, except then the nineteen the original nineteen sixty paper is Davis Putnam. But then, uh, uh, the, you know, this this whole group of uh, co-authors basically, I think they left Putnam out. He must have graduated or something. And uh, essentially, in nineteen sixty two, they wrote a paper that actually had a few more uh, uh, sort of improvements to this thing. So, so I mean, the, the worst case is going to be exponential. That's uh, that's that's why p versus NP is a big question, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but but there's all, all these optimizations you can do. So, for example, if I have a clause that says says A, the only way to, way to make that clause true is if A is true. So A is true, <laughs> and then you can go through the rest of the clauses. You can just strike out A, and and if if that means that uh, uh, so, so in particular, if A has to be true, and making A true means there's no way to satisfy some other somewhere else like at A uh, not A. Then I can immediately give up, right? Like this, uh, this whole thing is as soon as you you only have to look at, uh, in particular, m m maybe you you know you sort by the length of the clauses, and then you, you're working your way through, and then trying to uh, uh, trying to chew through the easy ones first, because in particular, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, it, it, so several different options, right? I, I might look at A and be able to just from scratch figure out there is no way A can be false. I can immediately figure it out. That uh, so if, if so, I do it and uh, and substitute it out. If not, then what I have to do is I have to say, well, A could be true, in which case I have one whole subspace, or A could be false, in which case I have a whole sort of unrelated subspace. And and the idea is I really want to find which subspace is going to have an answer, uh, and or, or or you know maybe both subspaces immediately lead to a contradiction. So it turns out there's no way to to get this done. So so the cool part is there's a beautiful recursive algorithm for this. That again, worst case is two to the end, just because the, it, you may not be able to hit any easy cases, right? And as I, I may not find any uh, uh, any situations where uh, I, I can immediately look at the thing and figure out figure out the value of the variable. But it turns out real you know, real world problems tend to have lots of parts that are fairly obvious, right? And, and uh, in particular, uh, you can you can you can do those uh, do those first. So uh, uh, pruning super duper valuable. This actually blows away like exponentially sized parts of your search space. So for example, if the first variable I look at, right, I, I, I have no particular way to uh, uh, pick variables, that the first one I look at, it turns out true seems interesting, false can't be done, just impossible, right? Uh, then immediately I, 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 just, I just lost half the search space. I'm at two to the n minus one now. If I if I can if I can just assign one to be true, so so you can you can knock off a ton of work at, uh, if, uh, with these optimizations. Uh, 
So he, here's here's some hastily written pseudocode, and this is actually missing the. Uh, uh, so, so these are my optimizations, my early exits. So for example, if you get to the point where uh, uh, I have uh, uh, I, I have an empty clause, in other words, there's no way to make it true at this point, then I just have to give up, and uh, that, that this whole sub uh, sub tree is is gone. Uh, if I have no clauses left to satisfy, then I'm done, and uh, and and that was the right one. So essentially, I. I don't know, throw or something to get out of this recursive uh, uh, train because I actually want to cancel all the other recursions once I find uh, the first solution that works. Uh, and then I, I basically just uh, pick a zip. So I, ideally here, I guess I would now look for look for a variable that's alone by itself and then can be can be optimized away. Uh, and if if not, then the worst case is I just pick a variable. I I, I basically reconstruct this whole expression using that variable as uh, substituting that variable in uh, as false. Or, or that variable in is true, and these are my two sub uh, sort of subtrees that I'm going to have to explore. Yeah. Is there not a reason to do like a, a linear like pre-optimization step before you start the recursion, just like eat out all the things that are obvious? Probably, actually, that, that, that probably needs to go in here. So this would be like the uh, uh, some sort of optimization step. Yeah, le left is an exercise. That's assuming I can figure out how to write one, uh, write one reasonably. So, so yeah, uh, so, so this thing is recursive. Worst case, clearly, if you can if the, the optimization step or, or the early exits don't actually save you any work, you clearly have like you know exponential amount of work in the number of variables, and that's just the, that's you're, you're kind of stuck with that. So, uh, surprising fact is that most real problems you can do a heck of a lot of pruning and optimization. Like they don't, they, 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 they do end up being simpler than, than you'd think. So, so the, the, there's a bunch of solvers out there. There's actually like a, uh, there's a SAT solving competition, satcompetition.org, which uh, hopefully is still around. So, so every year they have one of these and uh, so let's see. Oh, maybe not in 2018 because you'd think they would have posted the results. So, so essentially, like there's you know different uh, different solvers. Uh, I I interesting subcategories. They're actually really good unsat solvers, right? And there's proving there is no uh, uh, assignment that works. And in, in that case, essentially, you're you're just uh, uh, right. The, the pruning ideally has to sort of go both directions here. As soon as I figure out I can't do it, I give up. And that actually makes it faster to do a, a satisfiable uh, uh, instance. So, uh, yeah, so let's see. Ah, there is a standard file format for this, which is a little surprising. So uh, it's, it's Dimax conjunctive normal form. <laughs> and uh, uh, essentially here, so what I'm using minus sign to indicate this thing is inverted, right? So I have not A, not B, right? Uh, and not B, not C. And, and then a, a, uh, a or B or C. I, I think this is basically the... Uh, this is the graph coloring thing we looked at uh, last time. So, so essentially, I mean, just it, it starts with the letter P as, as set, set some predicates. It's in conjunctive normal form. There's three total variables of so pre you can pre cut your array of variables, and there's four total clauses. For some reason, clauses uh, uh, end in a zero and uh, are on a new line. It seems like one or the other would be enough, but uh, you know. so uh, uh, basically just a, a giant text file. Uh, of course, uh, you can uh, you can regularly get these things solved, even if they get 100,000 variables, and like, you know, we are so much better than exponential, it's kind of hard to convey how how far we are from it, because, I mean, if, if it really was exponential was the usual uh, uh, case, then like, you know, 40 variables would be a real chore, and like 60 variables would be pretty much unsolvable, and 100 is just out of the, out of the question. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely better than that, which is a little surprising. So, for example, uh, graph coloring. I, again, this is uh, draw draw each of the vertices with uh, fill it in with a color, so that uh, uh, you don't have the same color along uh, any of the edges. And it turns out some graphs can be colored using only three colors, and some graphs can't be colored using only three colors. What are we coloring? Coloring vertices. Coloring vertices. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, the, it, it's actually the dual problem of coloring the edges so that no two edges of the same color land in the same vertex. Actually, if, if you're doing edge coloring, uh, could you color this either of these graphs? Well, so, so the big problem is if each of my incoming edges needs a separate color, 
and I have four edges landing at one vertex, there's no way I can have, you know, I would need four separate colors to color this one, so you just you couldn't do it. Uh, it so so, so th th this is the dual uh, question. I'm, col I'm putting ver uh, colors to the vertices. So in particular, like A is going to be, uh, so it turns out you have three colors, pick red to start with, so I'm going to say A is red. So that means none of these four can be red because they're adjacent to a red vertex. So they got to be green or blue. They can't be the same color, so this has got to be green, blue, green, blue. And it's actually exactly the same graph over here. Uh, now, uh, you actually get into trouble here. So if this is green and this is blue, that's okay. This can be red. Uh, this is green and this is blue. Um, it has a red neighbor, a green neighbor, and a blue neighbor. There is no way to three-color the left graph. Uh, here, uh, so I had green, blue, green, blue. What color do I make this one? It's actually only adjacent to greens. So I can make that one blue, and then this one green, because it's only adjacent to blues. Ideally, I would have a slide with the colors here. Or you could have made it red. I could have made this one red, and yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and then but and yeah. So so, uh, so it, it turns out this one is three colorable, and this one isn't, which isn't obvious at all. Looking the, like just you know they look they clearly have the same structure, the same degrees and such. It's just th th there's actually something kind of deep about the structure of the graph that makes it be three colorable. W one of the world experts on graph coloring problems is uh, uh, Dr. Hartman, and and Dr. Chapel as well. Is it, is it the conjoined triangle? <laughs> ah, it's 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 weirder than that. It's just like, yep, there's this property, and it's it's not. I mean, the weird part of the colorability is it's a sort of global property of the graph. Like, I, if I if I take two three colorable graphs and I stick them together, there's some ways to stick them together that are still three colorable, and other ways that aren't. So, uh, kind of, it's, it's just kind of an interestingly meaty property. Mm -hmm. uh, What's what's the uh, non-reduced form of colorable? Like, what what what, what does that represent in a, a larger you know context? Like, why do I care? Mm. Ah, I've actually used graph coloring uh, uh, when, for example, uh, the arrows indicate that uh, there's uh, there's a, a communication that happens between these two, and what I want to do is I want to partition the graph into sets that uh, can run independently without communicating. So, yeah. Uh, Okay. And particularly using the minimum number of sets so that I can do like three different phases and, uh, and, and not have any communication within the phases, so fairly, fairly common. Uh, so yeah, uh, so, so it, it turns out you can use SAT to solve graph three coloring, which I sort of ruined in the last lecture. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so the idea here is, uh, so, so SAT is underneath. We're going to put graph coloring on top of SAT. And, and in particular, figure out how to encode uh, the graph coloring problem on top of SAT. So, so this is this is good, good as a warm to figure out how to encode more complicated things as SAT. So uh, essentially, uh, uh, and, and we saw these clauses last time, wh what, are we, what are we conveying by saying R plus G plus B for this vertex? It must be one of the So one of red, green, or blue must be true. In other words, you need to pick, a, you need to pick at least one color. And, and then, uh, uh, let's see, so what I'm saying is, uh, uh, and you can't have the same color as, uh, as some of your neighbors. You know what's interesting about this? Uh, so if, if, for example, I say you got one vertex and no edges, all I know is that uh, red, green, or blue has to be true. In particular, they could all be true. So this will let you RGB color a graph with three simultaneous colors. Not usually how you three color a graph. So, yeah. so, so, so if you didn't like that, so, so in particular, this will tell you when a graph is uh, like a, a, a vertex and the finished graph can have more than one color. Right? That, uh, this, so this, this will let, uh, it, you, you may actually get multiple colors lit at the same time, which, uh, so, so in particular, this is saying, well, okay, just pick the first color, and if, if red is true, just make it uh, red. And uh, uh, if green is true, then you make it green, and, and, and you only do this after you've looked at the red, for example. So you could, and it, it doesn't matter because it could be any of the colors if you end up with multiples. If you don't like that, what clauses would you need to say you can be at most one of red, green, or blue? Yeah, yeah well, so, so in particular, like in Dimax, uh, you only have 
uh, your clauses are all ORed together. And then uh, t uh, it, it, it's ORed within a clause and then ANDed between clauses. So this can be each case where it's like red and not blue and not green or right. green and not yeah. red and yeah. not yeah. 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 Is there, is there a better way? Uh, I, I think traditionally you would so, so you, you do it actually very similar to this. So I'd say R of I and green of I can't both be true. Right? And, and in particular, like what I would do there is I'd say not red of I and uh, green of I at the same time. So, so the, and, and, and luckily that uh, De Morgan's law actually makes that one relatively easy to do, so it, you end up uh, basically just uh, uh, in, inverting the ors. So surprising fact, so you, you often start off saying like, oh, I want XOR, I want like implication. And then you have to figure out how to if incrementally transform this into just like ors and ands. And it, uh, if you squint at it for long enough, it apparently can be done. I, I have to say, I've never actually like uh, done the, the hard work of doing that. Uh, in particular, like uh, uh, pretty pretty good to make a tool to do this rather than just like I'm sure you could just like drive yourself mad with these long like Dimax files of uh, you know uh, hand numbered clauses. In fact, normally Dimax. <laughs> kind of weird. It's read by a SAT solver, but it's written by a program that generates SAT from the problem. So in particular, like here, we would say, you know, I, I, I have a graph coloring. I'm reading a graph in some reasonable format, and I'm spitting out this bizarre machine-emitted set of clauses. And, and then essentially the same program is going to read the output from the SAT solver and then spit out the actual graph coloring. So bottom line, you, you just got to figure out how to encode uh, all this stuff as, as your clauses. So how do we combine the, the system together? Do we just add all the edges together or something? So, so, so yeah, so, so for example, I've, I've got uh, these clauses R, RGB for vertex I, and then for, I just do the, one of these for each of the vertices. And now I have all the, you know, each vertex has its own little set of color variables. And then I, I'm uh, so, so so all of those get and, so essentially all of these clauses get and together. All of these uh, uh, sort of edge clauses get anded together. You end up with this enormous string of ands, mm -hmm. and and this represents like everything we want to be true about the graph in the end. So there's going to be a massive number of individual variables. <laughs> yeah, so, so how many do we end up with in the end? Well, we clearly have three times vertices number of variables. How many clauses do we end up with? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's one per vertex, and, and then three per edge. Mm -hmm. So it's V plus 3E is the number of clauses, and then three, three times V is the number of variables. So the cool part is those are all polynomial. So we're in the polynomial. Actually, they're all linear, so that's uh, even better. Uh, so certainly are going to be cases where for every combination, so every, every edge, and every vertex is going to have to have some combination like uh, edges. Uh, so, so then you get a V times E term. To me, that, uh, that, that breaks out of the L space. But uh, I, I think that's, uh, that, that, that it, it doesn't bother anybody else. So that, uh, that seems to be OK. So we have a polynomial or lower transformation. Y yeah. And, and in particular, if somebody can come up with a polynomial times solver for SAT, it, it, in practice, like they're not even like it's it, it's almost better than that. Like they're, they're pretty close to linear for a, a, a sort of simply structured problem. In particular, a lot of graph uh, uh, graph coloring turns out to not really be that hard to pull off, right? Like this, so we, we were able to just look at this and say like, okay, you know, we could uh, work it out by hand, indicating it must be relatively simple. Uh, so so, so uh, oftentimes your performance is really uh, surprisingly good, uh, yeah, and. Uh, uh, Sat, sat delivered performance for real problems tends to be fairly good. At, at least if the problems aren't that hard in some sense. Yeah. Is there any tree solving problem that doesn't devolve down to an exponential worst case? Probably. Uh, sh shortest paths, right? Uh, which actually seems like it would be exponential worst case because you, you could, I mean, the, the, the exponential version of. Uh, uh, and we, we haven't really done any graph algorithms, I guess, yet. We, we say that's, that's, uh, apparently, that's later this semester. Well, I mean, the thing is, is if you have a really strong um, heuristic, you can like, often trim it down. But hmm. the thing is, is but, but, how good is your heuristic, right? Well, well like, like Dijkstra's shortest path like finds the shortest path from one node to every other node. And it does it in polynomial time. It does not need to consider every possible tree, which is a little surprising. In particular, there's a way of ordering the traversal. 
such that you don't have to sort of re-look at other paths you've looked at before. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so it turns out there are like, and, and Dijkstra sounds NP to me, right? Like uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's the best amongst a tree that has an exponential number of possible paths through it. Like that that sounds like it would end up being NP, and and it turns out something about the structure of that one is different. Uh, what it is, I'm not well, sure. Isn't Dijkstra's a special case of a larger algorithm? Uh, I, th I thought it was a special case of actually an A star style. Yeah, I, I would say A star is kind of a generalization of uh, Dijkstra. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but, but, but bottom line, right? Uh, in general, as as long as you have a polynomial time transformation to SAT, you can actually get pretty decent performance. And and, and this is true of actual real uh, uh, world problems. So let's see. I, okay, we are twenty six minutes in. I don't think I can actually cover all the material I wanted to cover. So uh, let's let's uh, do your choice. So uh, there's a beautiful piece of computer science theory showing that how we can take a non-deterministic Turing machine and turn it into a SAT instance, okay. or we can look at a tool that takes a, a, a C program and turns it into a SAT instance. Which are you interested in? It, it, so so it, it should be obvious these are sort of the same operation. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that, that in particular, if, if I can take a Turing machine and turn it into a SAT instance, I should be able to take a C program and turn it into a SAT instance, right? Because so, I mean, uh, they're, they're equivalent, right? Yeah. So which would you like? I, I think the, tool. the tool sounds simpler, but okay. the theory sounds more tool. useful. Yeah. Well, well, we're going to do them both. It's just which one do we do today and which one do we save for Friday, tomorrow? <laughs> Just see one today, I would say. Okay, I get tool. Yeah. Tool sounds bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem to feel like it's the theory. Okay. Sure. Yeah, and, and uh, I guess uh, the, 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 this was a lot of theory. So uh, the, the, the beautiful tool is called CBMC. It's the bounded model checker. It's actually built into, so I, I like it so much I put it in net run. It's, uh, it's in your repos. So you can actually go and you can say, uh, so write CBMC, it's hiding in there next to the rest of these things. Now, what this, what this does, so how do you make a C program? So I'm, I'm going to write a main, and then somehow I want a SAT instance? Like, wait, what? So in particular, like, uh, I can't get variables out, right? Like, I can't, I can't like, return numbers. A SAT is going to say yes or no. So somehow I want a bool out of a program. And uh, it's, it's actually not done by returning. CBMC, is, it's, it's the bounded model checker. It's designed to actually find security flaws in programs. It's designed to find assertion failures in programs. So for example, if, if I say assert, and I say assert false, this is essentially like, uh, uh, this is this uh, assert zero. There is no way this program ever passes its asserts. So if, if you just ask CBMC, hey, does it pass its asserts? It really thinks about it and it's like, all right, ready to do this. And it ends up making, uh, let's see, there is, uh, let's see, one clause and it's unsatisfiable. So in particular, let's see, so this, uh, Negated claim is satisfiable, does not hold. So here's the counterexample. The program starts up and it failed its assertions, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so you, your program, there's a way for it to fail its assertions. Okay, that was, that was too easy. So if I, and if I say assert one, again, it'll set up this clause. There's literally one clause and it's like, yeah, uh, I think it works. <laughs> Like, there's, it doesn't do anything. So here, here's where this gets interesting. It actually supports variables. So if I say x equals 1 and I assert x, like, this is the same program. And it knows it's the same program. Kind of cool. Uh, if I say x equals 0, then, again, it's the same program as before. This one fails its assertions because there's no way that this cannot be true. How about this? x is uninitialized. And, and this is where the tool gets beautiful. Uh, uninitialized is the variables. And uh, you know what? There's 32 bits, because I said it was an int. Right. So if you run this thing, this suddenly it's like, oh, OK, we get, we get some stuff. I guess I'm only looking at, uh, at uh, the, the, the low value. So, so here, here's what's beautiful about this tool. It, there, there's a couple of built-in, like uh, the state of malloc and stuff. And then it's going to say, you know what? If x is 0, you failed your, uh, your asserts. And, uh, it's actually smart enough to do anything I want on x. So for example, I can say x equals uh, uh, x, x, or x. 
And uh, I can now look at the low bit of x. And it's going to come up with a, a specific counterexample that makes my assert fail, if there's a way to do it. Does that make sense? And uh, surprisingly enough, I, I can literally do it. So I can have uninitialized variables. Actually, this really reminds me of a quantum. Like, uh, this, this is actually very similar to uh, uh, my, my former flawed view of what a, how a quantum computer worked. Like, this is like superposition. Right? I have an uninitialized variable that's like any possible thing. And then I do some sort of entanglement. And then what I want is I actually want to look at the collapse. This is it actually turns out not how a quantum machine works because things like assignment can't be done. There's actually a bunch of gates that, uh, like the destructive gates, destroy your entanglement, and uh, it's 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 worse than that. But this literally works this way. So in particular, th this will look at this and say, okay, if x is zero, you uh, XOR it and then AND it and oh, oh did, did I not hit run? X has to be one. Yeah. Okay. And so here's here's the way this works. X was one uh, in state fifteen on line four. That's where X is declared. And then in state sixteen on line five, X is zero when it got XORed. And now that fails your asserts. So this is like, wait a sec. Okay. Uh, so let me set up. Uh, let me do factoring. Right. I'm gonna have X and Y. I'm gonna set up uh, X times Y. There's Z. And now I'm going to say, I bet you can't set z uh, equal to 12. Of course, there's a way to do this, right? 3 times 4. Let's, let's make it harder. Let's say uh, set z equals to 11. 11 is prime. What, uh, what do you think? Does this pass as a search or not? I mean, it's prime. Oh shoot! Uh, we did. We didn't. So yeah. Uh, and th so so l l let's see what it thinks x and y are. It's like x equals uh, one. Y is initialized to one. Uh, let's see. Z equals one. Wait, what? Oh shoot! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I need to assert that z is not eleven. And this always seems backwards to me. Uh, yeah. So. You didn't found it, so I'm uh, actually, and I think I'm going to say, so, so this is clearer. I think if I uh, right, found it means z equals eleven, right? Uh, that's that's what I want to find, and then I have to dare it, saying like, I bet you can't ever find it. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, it seems seems backwards, but uh, that's that's the way we do this. So of course it's going to pick one and eleven. Okay, fine. Ah. Uh, what I need is I need to actually restrict my superposition to just the range that I'm interested in. So, for example, and uh, there's a there's a built-in for this. C prover assume, and and this is to, uh, so uh, assume it's going to force x and y to obey these. Uh, so, so this is just basically just adding clauses direct to this at instance, right? So I, I can say x has to be greater than one and y has to be greater than one. Like it was simple. Uh, what's 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 the next uh, and uh, it just factored 11 somehow. How can you factor 11 using numbers that are bigger than 1? Picks, see, 3 times 1.4 billion gives you 11. Oh. <laughs> You're like, wait, what? Overflow? Yeah, it's totally exploiting overflow here. Uh, Look, so. I'm just handling booleans. It's really simple. Uh, and its you know, compiler knows about overflow. Yeah, it, it really is eleven. It, it, you know, it. it uh, whoa, that's that's scary. Good. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So so he, he, here's the thing I want to factor. So here's my uh, my prime is eleven. So if you do this right, so it has to be. Uh, I, I want factors between uh, one and the prime, and this is literally like the definition of factoring. That normally you don't get you don't get overflow when you're doing factoring, but uh, okay. That's see if uh, see. If, okay, and I'll be darned. It says uh, the negated claim is unsatisfiable. In other words, the verification is successful. Your assert that you could not find it was true. You can never find it. There is no way to factor eleven, which is which is good, right? That's that's what I want out of this thing. But boy, you gotta lock the thing down. And uh, yeah, kind of surprising. Uh, 
so right. How does it compare to a proper? Oh my practice? God, it's terrible. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, but but uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 not so terrible. So let me just do a big number there. Uh, I guess I, I can make these longs. I, I think I think long is sixty-four bit on this one. So th there's there's my big long. You, ooh, yeah. So it uh, it ran. So it took more than two seconds to run that, which is kind of disturbing. So uh, yeah, didn't. Uh, did, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it'll it'll do reasonably big, but uh, multiplication turns out to make this giant like so. See if it did. Oh, okay. Apparently that is some big. And then put L afterwards. So it's fifty-five times some giant thing. Huh. Okay. Oh, putting a five in was probably not a great idea. Yeah. Uh, seven. Now it'll probably be multiple of three. Uh, yeah. It's, oh, so now it's multiple of seventeen. Oh, gosh. Uh, nine. Probably one of these is probably multiple of three. Yeah, that's multiple of three. Sure, 21. Multiple of 13, I don't know. So uh, it's uh, yeah. not. <laughs> right. I, I've, I've also had problems where, it, essentially, if, if you're doing ints, then it'll take a number like this that's like, uh, it, so, so it'll take two numbers that are below the prime, but not much below. So that then, then they overflow when they get the right answer. It's, uh, it's it, it really loves doing overflow, which is so, so it, this is super powerful. This is a great way to find uh, security flaws. In other words, like here's the code that I have that reads the data from the file and then is going to about to do file operations. Is there any way somebody can feed me a file that makes me get a negative array index? So lets me trash data structure in the program. Uh, so, so so in other words, this is this is uh, pretty powerful. Uh, yeah, again, it's 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 actually not great at, at, at factoring. In particular, a program that's custom designed to do factoring knows about the structure of factoring, take advantage of all that stuff. So this is not going to do that. But the cool part is this is literally a general purpose tool. If, if instead of figuring out like primes, I want to figure out uh, so somebody has done their own hand rolled encryption thing, and they're doing a bitwise or with a, a bitwise XOR. Uh, that's just as easy for this, if not easier, because they're all logical operations. So in particular, like you can, I, and uh, I was so excited when I saw this, I'm like, I want all the Bitcoin. <laughs> if you can find something that has a uh, SHA-256 hash of all zeros, you win all the Bitcoin. You can mine anything. It's kind of surprising. So uh, yeah, it turns out SHA-256 uh, has a structure where the SAT instance gets bigger and bigger and bigger, as as it should, right? <laughs> and in particular, this this may be one of the criteria that the NSA used to pick the that and, uh, that hash algorithm, saying like shouldn't be obviously vulnerable to a SAT uh, solver, because uh, probably they they knew they knew about uh, how to do these things. So so for example, here like uh, not not really sure how to make that out of a combination of bitwise ands or with bitwise xors, but uh, supposedly those work and they're in the right, uh, I, I told it the range I was looking for. And you know what, if you're like, yeah, I don't like that one, G give me another one. Uh, I just have to say, and why ain't that one? I didn't like that one, give me another. And of course, now it's going to pick a different one. And now, why? Oh, it, it made X that one. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so slippery, this thing. Uh, X is not that one either. Uh, give me a totally different one. And it's like, uh, sure. Yeah, there it is. Uh, that's very similar. I think it changed one bit. Yeah, that is a different one, but sim similar idea. So yeah, uh, and and in particular, if you say like there's a whole class of these I don't like, and uh, bitwise, you know, why bitwise and uh, I don't I don't want any of the low bits to be set. Right, that has to be zero. Sure, you can probably still do it, uh, unless you can't. So it'll say, yep, all the low bits of y are all zero. That's cool, uh, and. Uh, it, it it actually is a little bit amazing. I mean, so so this one was pretty simple, right? Seven hundred variables, sixteen hundred clauses. It solves in like instant, like you know, a millisecond. It's just like no, <laughs> boom. Uh, bit, bit, in general, bitwise operations super amenable to this. And anybody that rolls around crypto that doesn't know about SAT solvers is probably vulnerable to a SAT solver. Uh, you, you have to, you have to actually go to 
some it, it, you need like nonlinear operations like the carries that are inherent in multiplication in order to like uh, uh, make this complicated. Uh, I'm sure the multiply one you can't you can't do it. It's literally impossible with the constraints I made. Like the low bits of y have to be zero. It's like yeah, can't do it. Not uh, not possible. So uh, can probably I, I don't know, x never wanted to be that. So it's fine. But th those are just d dead clauses that uh, that will subtract out of there. So this literally is 10,000 variables, 34,000 clauses, but it only takes 22 milliseconds to solve, right? Clearly way better than exponential, right? Two to the 9,000 is just inconceivable, right? Uh, but but uh, most of these clauses are worthless, right? Like uh, uh, if you if you think about the clauses that result from multiplication, you get lots and lots of clauses getting all the high bits. Well, I've told it what the answer is. In particular, it knows all the high bits are zero. So a bunch of those clauses actually just end up getting just deleted out of there, and basically immediately saying, like, high bits, there are no high bits. Actually, there are no high bits on the inputs or the outputs, right? Uh, and and, and in, in some ways, this, uh, uh, this is like the sort of easy, like, when you know the answer, you know what you're looking for, like, that's, that's great. Right, uh, this, this is sat is actually really able to start crunching away and winnowing down the properties that you need on the inputs. I mean, it's, the, the wacky part about this is most programs, you need to feed them inputs and then they tell you what the outputs are. With sat, you can tell it what the outputs are that you want and the computation you're doing, and it'll tell you what the inputs are, which is a little wacky. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, so, so if, uh, if, if the computation you're doing is complex enough, then it just, it, uh, I mean, it, it, SAT would totally solve this. Uh, it would just be slower than doing it the uh, brute force way, which, uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, the SHA-1 uh, collision, I don't know if you heard about this, but basically Google found a SHA-1 collision to make it so you can bake two PDFs that have different content but have the same SHA-1 hash. Uh, the, the, the way they, so, so, but part of the guts of that was basically like they, they, they did a bunch of, uh, uh, they, they found this vulnerability in the SHA-1 round function. And, and essentially the way they exploited the vulnerability was a bunch of compute and then this big SAT solver that's actually trying to trying to match, and they, they knew where, where the outputs are, they wanted to find something that matches this hash. And then they used this SAT solver to find the space of possible inputs. And it, uh, it was like a month something solve. Uh, and, and, and they, they had a, a hundred other things in, in there to basically get it to the right spot. Because like a naive SAT attack is not really going to get you there. And, and in particular, you, you know, uh, one of the most valuable things a SAT solver can tell you is you can't do it, right? Uh, in particular, like even if uh, uh, it can't find you the answer, if it can tell you uh, there is no answer, right? If, if I say uh, beat, both of these have to be less than the, the prime over two, then uh, uh, let's see. You can still do it, apparently. 13 is still less than the I'm forgetting how factoring works. Uh, less than the square root of the prime? I, is there a factor between 1 and 10? And it turns out the answer should be no. Yeah, the answer is no. So, so, so the, I mean, th this alone can kind of save you something. E even if uh, uh, SAT can't tell you the exact answer, being able to at least know that like certain of these SAT instances are unsatisfiable means that you, you, know, you can immediately drop those out of your search space and try to figure out how to do these. So does the basic idea here make sense? So essentially, it's just it's checking asserts. You can do literally any computation here, including stuff involving like so. If I start z equals zero and have a for loop, uh, so I'm going to do a bunch of rounds. I'm going to do I don't know uh, i times x times y. So do some operation in here. That that's totally fine. This is not really factoring anymore. This is some other thing. Like this is probably fact. It's probably factoring. Uh, multiple. I guess i equals zero is really uninteresting too. Uh, so so y you can actually do uh, quite a lot here. So how is it going to actually write down a sat? Right, so with arithmetic it's fairly obvious. Actually in particular with arithmetic, with bitwise arithmetic it's hopefully really obvious that like I declare long x it's like okay I got sat variables that, that's all the bits of x. I say z equals x bitwise and y. Okay, all my variables for z are constrained to be equal to you know uh, the x uh, x times y, uh, 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 x bitwise and y, and 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 essentially like uh, when it's looking for an assert failure like this or something, this this boils down to saying like all the bits of z have to have these values, and then the you know the, the, the solve is fairly straightforward. How do you do a loop 
because there's no loops in Dimax, right? Like this, uh, uh, this format is a fixed length format, which is a little wacky, right? Like that's, you have to know how many claws are to start with. So it, it unrolls loops, which is one of the, uh, and, and particularly if you have a data dependent loop, it, uh, it, it, it does a, so, so uh, the B in CBMC is bounded. In other words, it will check sort of a fixed size amount of code, in particular, like a fixed number of iterations of the loop. So if, if I go ahead and run this thing, then essentially, like at, at 10, 10 iteration, you can see it's actually literally, it printfs to the screen when it unrolls a loop, which would indicate that like, if you go kind of nuts with a bunch of nested loops, you're going to have a lot of stuff on the screen, and you're going to get a sort of giant, like, awful, sad instance. This is apparently impossible. Well, we did constrain one of the yeah, and, and actually, this is making me think that, like, uh, they all have to be multiples of whatever I is. No. I, 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 there's some algebra you can do in this. Actually, they have, they have to be, it's got to be multiple of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 9, I think. Oh, yeah, that would, that would probably give it a, a better shot. Uh, let's see, and uh, I, I don't even know if I need to be less than the prime. It's probably going to exploit overflow now. In fact, that may be the only way to do it is to exploit overflow. So, of course, yeah, it figures out like, ginormous thing! Like, those are totally overflowing. <laughs> and uh, but, but, but essentially, you can actually watch. I equals 1, Z equals negative gibberish. I equals 2, more gibberish. I equals 3, gibberish, 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 gibberish. And then finally at the end, cancellation, boom. Right? That's the, that's the one we're looking for. <laughs> Kind of surprising, and then that's uh, that's that's the last one, and uh, it's scary good at exploiting over. Actually, I, I have to say, like the the whiff of uh, uh, Skynet or uh, the sort of singularity, like uh, hey, machines from the future, please don't kill us because we can't possibly stop you, because <laughs> they are just in a millisecond able to say like, yes, I see what you're doing, and I have moved to counter that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and uh, you really got to spec the uh, like the Skynet spec better be airtight, literally machine checkable tights, because otherwise it's going to figure out some way to. Yeah. My legs are currently stable, so it's hard yeah. to chase after you. <laughs> How do I keep moving so I yeah. can shoot you more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, arbitrary computation, uh, arbitrary kind of arithmetic. You, can, I mean, uh, how do you how do you do like an if statement? I mean, that's easy. All the arithmetic is just has an extra clause saying the then happened, right? Uh, or if it's in the else, the else happened, right? So you just uh, you know, fairly straightforward. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and, and these get huge, right? So it unrolled this thing. It's like, yeah, I got 80,000 variables, right? And, uh, you know, half a million, per, three, third of a million clauses. And it's like, well, I had to think about that a tad, you know, for under a half second. <laughs> Uh, so, so it, it turns out uh, uh, converting your problem to a sad instance is a super powerful way to, uh, to uh, sort of exploit the, the intelligence baked into uh, uh, you know the, these these existing algorithms. Uh, one thing I ever want to do, and uh, this is uh, this is in the lecture notes as well as a uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's find uh, instant uh, instant singularity by making CBMC write code for us. How do we do that? Hmm. So sh shades of the homework. I, I claim the easy way to do this is I'm going to have it write a program, right? Mm -hmm. The program is going to have some, you know, data in it. I, I leave it uninitialized, meaning it's going to write it. And now I write the virtual machine that says what the program is supposed to do, and then just assert that it worked. And then dare it to say otherwise. Have you tried this? I have totally tried this several times. And it's scary good. So so let's build a little okay, so let's 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 do a little virtual machine. So I'm gonna do uh I'm gonna do UAMU because I can write that in my sleep. Uh, so here's my instruction. My instructions are gonna be sixteen bits. Sixteen bit. Instructions. They uh, blah, blah, blah. 
front those my instructions uh, and, and let's do short programs because they're easier for us to understand so all I'm gonna do is uh, uh, loop over the program counter starts at zero program counter is less than I'm gonna start super short like I'm gonna say you get one instruction and uh, basically ask if it can get some work done I guess to get some work done I need some registers so I'm just declare a little register file uh, I'm gonna do yeah, let's see I, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a bug in here and then show you how it uh, will exploit that bug uh, so uh, b b pull the next instruction so here, here's the next instruction uh, so it's gonna be basically the program at uh, index program counter uh, how do you do indexing inside So this is a good reason to keep these things short. The way it does it is it actually builds a, like, how you do this in logic, right? I got, like, uh, array entry 0, 1, 2, 3, and I have address bins. And essentially I have a mux that gets me the, the low bits, like, uh, to, uh, to combine, and then the high bits combine. So it, it actually builds a multiplexer array to pull out what inst, you know, the, the next instruction has to be based on this variable per, uh, to, uh, index. So uh, it, it, it's actually relatively cheap for short arrays. A again, all this stuff actually scales really beautifully for like in the onesies uh, up to 10. You get into the hundreds or thousands, it starts to just be like millions of clauses and the SAT just has to Is crunch the away. The <laughs> Not that I know of, because that mm, yeah, would, would be, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's probably the ideal thing to ask SAT solvers to start working on. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 yeah. uh, the, the scary part about this is they're literally better than me at writing a code. So let's see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pull out the operation that I want to do, put that in the high bits. So let's do instruction. Uh, so I can just uh, uh, instruction and F. So that's the op code. Uh, code. We're going to have the destination register. This is literally, I think, the one that I did for lecture notes. So that uh, that's good. Sure. So take the instruction uh, eight. Am I doing this right? Um, so, but, but the, the highest four bits are the opcode, the next four bits are the destination register, and it's the same deal for these two source registers. So I get source one and source two. Are those supposed to be octal numbers? Those are not supposed to be octal. You got your misconnects then. Ah, uh, right. Thanks. Yeah, F is not good in octal. So uh, essentially, so, so now if, uh, if I'm doing operation and uh, I'm trying to remember what I did, uh, so combine is going to be register dest equals register of source one uh, plus register of source two and uh, if opcode equals uh, bitwise and is what I'm going to do for the other one and uh, you could make up a lot more options here but uh, I claim it's actually kind of more impressive you get a machine that does bitwise and and bitwise or it has no ability to load constants right so if my registers are uninitialized uh, so, so I'm going to say at the end, register zero has to be the value uh, uh, seven. What, uh, w what's it going to do here? So it wants to break my asserts. This is the its whole goal in life. You wrote uh, source one twice there. On the so that uh, that would make it even harder for it to get anything interesting done. So essentially, uh, re regs of regs of zero uh, has to end up with the value seven. Uh, it, it turns out uh, it can do this with no instructions <laughs> by just saying, well, let me show you the counterexample. The regs are, oh, regs. Oh, I called it reg in one place and regs when I declared it. So, okay, so I, my, my register file, so it's going to fail. So this basically will set up this giant uh, instance and then immediately say, wait a sec, if register zero start off with a value seven, then you're done. Oh, well, that wasn't that very interesting. So I'm going to say, registers start off all being zero. You get no instructions. This, I claim, should be impossible. And yeah, it thinks it's impossible, uh, which is good. So let's l let it do an instruction. And it's immediately, so uh, how, how, does, how does this work? Because <laughs> uh, uh, so, so the counterexample is going to write a program with some data in it. The register file starts off being zero. It then... Let's see, at program counter equals zero, it's going to pull this instruction. It's going to pull source, uh, let's see, source one is 12, source, two, oh, source one is 12. I only have 10 registers. Out of bounds, data. This is one way it will try to break your program, right? Is it, it will say, ah, you're doing a variable array index. If I can get that variable array index to leave the array, I break 
you know, the everything about your program, essentially. So uh, if, if, if you want this to work, you have to either set it up so the bits in the indexes are constrained to live in the size of the array, or you put in C prover assumes on all your indexing to say, like, really, that's not where I want you to break it. Okay, so we, we've just hopefully made it, we've forced it to break uh, there. Oh, and uh, you can't do it. It's impossible, right? If my registers start at all being zero, and I'll get one instruction during which I can only like add and bitwise and registers, you can't get the seven. There's no way to get to anything. Uh, so I can put in some stuff. So, y you know, you can make this really easy on it. Like, okay, I'm going to give you registers of three and four. You know, so there's only one instruction that does this, right? Uh, that basically, like, you got to add the three to the four and put the result in zero, and that's the instruction it's going to pick. So it's just, and you notice it didn't. It took 24 milliseconds to like figure out how I'm writing code, uh, and then prints this in hex and in decimal, but not in uh, uh, not in. Or it, it prints it in, in decimal and binary, but not in hex. And I, I claim the Ewing mu style machine code works best in hex. Uh, and somewhere I've actually, I think I've got a decoder of CPMC. I thought I did. CPMC recipe code? Yeah. So th th this, this is the, all this does is print stuff in hex. So print it. Uh, so that's C, which is an add instruction. Uh, uh, destination register zero, source registers two and one, and of course that's you know, that's that's literally the only in instruction that will work here, right? So okay. let's let's make its job harder, right? So you get a three and a five. Your job is to get to seven. Good luck. Yeah, you can't do it. It's impossible, and uh, yep, it's impossible, and it, it sees that it's impossible in twenty four milliseconds, right? Uh, how about okay? Let's let's let's, uh, let's see. Give it. Uh, you get a three, five, and a two. You want to get to seven. Yeah. Oh, five, five. Shoot, that's that is too easy. Uh, you get a three, a four, and a two. That's still too easy. Three, one, add three, four. Oh. Uh, how about eleven? Okay, I think we're we're at the impossible. Yeah. So with one instruction, you can't get to eleven. Hopefully. Nope, no, no way to get to eleven. But you give it two, ins two, uh, t uh, two instructions, and uh, then it immediately finds the right way to do this. Essentially, it's gonna what it's gonna do. Uh, it's gonna set some register to first seven, and then uh, to what? Uh, then it got to eleven by adding uh, registers two and four. Just okay. Register four had value seven. Register two, ah, four, four plus seven. Yeah, yeah. Three, three plus four, and then adds four again. Yeah, so simple. Uh, th th yeah, we. Uh, this, this somehow this isn't quite as uh, nasty. I think uh, some of these I was like, uh, how do you, how do you do this? Okay, getting to eleven is easy. So all we need to do to make make it do now is make a better sense over. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, how, how do you get to one? I don't, I don't think it's actually possible. You don't have any minuses. Uh, it, it, it got there. How, how, how do you do this? Two, two times four. You don't have times. Uh, you, you have add and and. How do you get to one and two instructions? Seven and? No, no. Uh, the machines were able to do this in 34 milliseconds. <laughs> well, that's why we make machines do it for us instead of doing it ourselves. One day we're going to be getting to be lazy machine grandparents and, you know, call our children over and move along. I honestly am not sure how it did this, which is kind of embarrassing. I'm, I'm thinking it probably used bitwise and. Uh, if you can blow away the high bits from seven, okay. Oh, seven plus two gives you nine. nine seven. Bitwise and with seven gives you one. Yeah. I bet, and I bet you, I bet you there's a nine, and it'll pick a register to use it in. It's semi, it seems semi-random. So let's see. So maybe the easiest way is to see. Okay, yeah. Register zero equals nine. Ha! Ah. Beat you machines. <laughs> Just slower, <laughs> right? Uh, right now there's there's and and. Uh, uh, 
p pick an arbitrary problem you want solved. It'll solve it, which is weird. It, or it'll tell you it can't be. I mean, the the uh, uh, you know a program that like spits out some something or other seems reasonable. This to me is actually beautiful. Programs got to know its limitations. It knows its limitations. It says you can't do that. It's not possible. I have so checked all, all the ways of doing it. You can't. And and it, it, think about how many bits are in uh, that alone. <laughs> but much less like. And uh, I mean, this code, this is not like straight line code in any sense, right? I say at the end, this register has to have this value. That register could have come from anything, which could have come from anything. And it's just like, boop, there it is. Simple, right? How many, uh, how many instances in the Classes? Uh, it's probably thousands. Uh, yeah, 4,000 uh, 4, variables and 14. Must be, yeah. 14,000 clauses, I guess, because there's just not that many. Variable. Yeah. Now uh, you can totally uh, you can you can make this thing's job literally harder by giving it more wiggle room. So if I have a ten entry program, it actually is probably going to take it longer because it makes this big instance and then it un unwinds this thing and we get just enormous number of uh, right now. This took a third of a second. It took ten times longer because it had more space. In particular, it's just like oh my gosh, right? This this huge list of stuff. And then it's probably written a program where it's just like randomly moving crap around between registers, because this was just the first one it found. It's just like, uh, so, so, so probably better to actually start these with a very short leash, and it'll say, I need a little more, and then you give it a little more uh, space to, to do it. In particular, something like this, this is like amazing to me, because you can read from any register, you can write to any register. That means basically every register can, is this a full crossbar on every row of the sort of execution of the thing, and uh, it's totally able to do it. So you could do the sort of shortest program within a space sort of thing. It's actually really ideal to say, like, can you do it in 10 bytes? No. Can you do it in 20 bytes? Never mind. Can you do it in 12 bytes? Yes. Got it. Right. Uh, so, yeah. And, and uh, uh, now, now uh, the branching factor does get real. So, so if, if I add in, like, 150 different opcodes, then the branching factor at every level of this thing is 150. So if you have this like write x86 code, it's not going to run real quick, I don't think. But I, I, haven't, I haven't tried it. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. So in, in, in the lecture notes, there's basically literally these these two things. Well, it uh, uh, this literally uh, right. If, if you can figure out how to express this, right, that uh, this string of source code is a better CBMC, you probably don't want to start at 640K. You'd want to start really tiny. But basically, like, uh, have it write a better SAT solver, and then have that write a better SAT solver, and then have it repeat. And uh, I mean, I, I tell you that this may literally be the uh, the singularity algorithm if we can just figure out how to express that in, in something that current hardware can do. And uh, the, the thing that scares me about the like uh, the the five state Turing machines being unanalyzable by humans is we might not actually need any more. So, so there's this great question uh, uh, asked of uh, uh, the cosmology community: if uh, if you had to run your current code on machines from 20 years ago, or uh, the the code from 20 years ago on machines from today, which one would run faster? And they're like, oh, our current code on the old machines would be way better. And there is. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the software improvements have actually outstripped the harder improvements, at least in cosmology. Meaning, there's like lots of room, probably more room to go in making software faster. So it's it's actually quite possible the hardware of today, this laptop may be capable of like singularity, you know, uh, type stuff like uploading consciousness and solving fusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just accomplishing anything a human being could kind of imagine to ask it. It's just we don't have the software because we haven't figured out how to ask the software to write the software. We just have to get get that sort of boot enough bootstrap uh, in there to uh, to kick the thing off. Question Maybe. one is, is yeah. better CDMC than the Skynet. Yeah, and and what do you mean by better? And yeah, you, yeah, you really do want to have a lot of asserts on that. That's uh, <laughs> fairly important. Yes. Assert has all of users money after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it means by better. Yeah, that's, well, honestly, computational finance is really is trying to like figure out how do we steal. From these monkeys. Look, this I, is the I'm, not, I'm not saying that certain companies yeah. aren't trying to use AI to try and get all of the money, but it does seem like it. Uh, pr pr project plans due on Blackboard tonight. Yeah. So I